If you would find your friendship pad and uh, make note of the fact you're worshiping with us and pass that the length of your pew and back, that would be great. Well, uh, is it warm enough for you? <laughs> bad joke, bad joke. Um, if you are a guest among us today, we want to extend a, no pun intended, warm welcome to you. So, And if you are without a, a church home at this time, please uh, know that we would surely welcome you uh, into uh, the life of Valley Church, and uh, if you'd like to consider making this your home. So, welcome. Well, uh, next Sunday is going to be a special day. Uh, that is a communion Sunday, of course, which is always special, but also it is the uh, time of our uh, summer picnic. So that'll be happening right after worship next Sunday, uh, the 7th of August, and uh, I hope that you'll plan to stay and uh, partake of the food that will be provided for you. Fellowship ministry is providing, and all you have to do is come with an appetite and uh, wear your picnic clothes and be ready to have a good time. So I hope you'll join us next Sunday. Also next Sunday, um, I'm, I'm going to be AWOL for the weekend. Uh, <laughs> I'll be in Atlanta hosting a baby shower for my daughter, Erica. So, yeah. Uh, we uh, are very excited about the new addition to our family in September. So uh, I will be away for the weekend, but uh, it'll be to your benefit because the, uh, Matt Heisler, who is the youth minister at Lake Grove Church, and uh, a 2021 graduate of Princeton Seminary and uh, in the process toward ordination in our PCUSA uh, will be filling our pulpit and I know you'll enjoy Matt. He's a great guy and as you know, our young people and the young people at, at uh, Lake Grove were together this uh, past week for their mission experience and I'm told that our students just adore Matt so I hope they'll be here in droves to hear him preach. All right. I uh, also want to remind you uh, today about the welcome home kits that uh, Andrea has introduced to us. Kitchen, bath, and bedroom items need to be uh, brand new and can be dropped off in the bins uh, by the fireside room through the end of July. So that's coming up like today. Um, please visit our website for the full list of items that are needed. I bet you could sneak a few in even next week. So please uh, support this really exciting ministry. Uh, thank you to all uh, of you who supported our young people on their um, way to their mission trip, either financially or in your prayers. Uh, we are going to hear all about uh, what God did in and through them, uh, their time in uh, Salie, Arizona. Uh, they will be uh, sharing with us uh, on Youth Mission Sunday, which is coming up on August the 14th uh, during our regular worship Sunday. So hope that you'll join us for that and and. We promised, uh, as we commissioned them, that we would uh, be eager to hear their stories, so do come on that particular Sunday and uh, hear them as they share with us. There are other announcements, but I'll leave those to you to peruse. So with that, let's prepare our hearts now to worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship as found in your bulletins or on your screen. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a king above all gods. In his name are of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Let us worship God.
You may be seated. Please join me in prayer as we invite God's presence into our hearts and minds together. O oh God, whose chosen dwelling is the heart that longs for your presence and humbly seeks your love, we come to you to acknowledge and confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our hearts and soul, with all our minds and strength, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. And now let us pray in silence, centering our whole being in God's presence. Please stand and hear the good news. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to get, condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. Please greet those around you with the peace of Christ or by com commenting on the screen at this time.
right, let's be seated. And now as we come to our time to look to God's holy word, let's bow our hearts in a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Speak to us, O God. Speak to us your truth and open our hearts and our minds to your wondrous love. Silence in us any voice but your own and be with us now as we turn our full attention, our minds and our hearts to you. We pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, when I was back in seminary, one of the requirements for my preaching class at Fuller Seminary uh, was to visit a different church every Sunday, listen to the sermon, and then I had to write uh, an evaluation of the preacher's uh, delivery and content. So one really warm summer Sunday, kind of like this actually, uh, I worshiped with the good people of Claremont Presbyterian Church and listened to their pastor's sermon. Well, 34 years later, fast forward to today, uh, I will confess that I do not remember much of anything of the content or the delivery of Pastor Karen's sermon. But I do remember the joke that she told to begin her sermon. <laughs> so here's the joke. So it was the first Sunday of the new pastor's um, you know, first call at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, she was really excited to begin her ministry with this new congregation and look forward with great anticipation to the first worship service and the chance to deliver her inaugural sermon. Well, she took tremendous care in crafting her message for the morning. The service seemed to come off without a hitch. And then, uh, at the conclusion of the service, uh, the new pastor made her way to the back sanctuary door and began greeting people. That's where you get the real reviews on the morning. Um, all seemed to be going really well until an older little gentleman um, came through the greeting line and shook her hand and said, Pastor, your voice is too squeaky. <laughs> Well, the pastor was a little taken aback, but you know, there's one in every congregation, so you know, it's all right. <laughs> but the pastor was more than a little bit surprised when that same older little gentleman was back in line and standing in front of her once again. This time he looked her in the eye and said, Pastor, your sermon was too long. Whew. Well, by now the pastor was starting to get a little bit miffed. I mean, who is this guy? I mean, it's pretty rude. Well, you can understand the pastor's dismay when <laughs> she observed that same gentleman in the line a third time to deliver his final message. Pastor, your sermon had no point. <sighs> well, the pastor had had quite enough. So uh, she found one of her elders and told her what had happened and she said, what gives with this guy? And the elder said, oh, that's Bill. Don't mind him. He just repeats everything he hears. <laughs> After delivering uh, this punchline, uh, Pastor Karen said this. She said, it's a hard job leading the people of God in worship. So hard, in fact, that sometimes you're tempted to ask, why bother with worship? Well, after regularly leading worship pretty much every Sunday for the past 32 years, <laughs> thankfully I can say that there have been very few Sundays uh, where things have gone that sideways or anything close to that or that I've had to wrangle um, particularly cranky parishioners or wonder to myself, why bother with worship? 99.999% of the time, uh, as I've answered the call uh, to enter into worship with the people of God, my thoughts and feelings are far closer to the feelings that are expressed by the psalmist in our lovely psalm for this morning, Psalm 84. 
So let's turn our attention there now and listen together for God to speak. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Sienna. Really beautiful. Shannon Kirshner uh, serves as the pastor of Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago. And she uh, tells of a conversation that she had with her mom uh, when her mom was returning from a church-related conference. Her mom talked about uh, interesting classes and workshops that she attended, but her eyes really lit up as she told Shannon that the very best part of the conference was the worship. And Shannon, ever the pastor, said, wow, uh, what did you like so much about the services? No doubt she anticipated that her mom would reply, oh, the preaching or the music. Well, instead, her mother answered, the call to worship. Shannon was a little bit incredulous, and she said, the call to worship? And her mother explained, well, apparently at the beginning of each worship service in this conference, they... Uh, offered the very same call to worship each time. First, someone, she she described, would carry uh, down a pitcher of water and pour it in the baptismal font, much the same way we do, and would say, the font of our identity. Then another person would walk in carrying an open Bible and hold it up, and we would say, the book of memory. Then a couple of people would bring forward the bread and the cup and place it on the Lord's table, and we would say together, food for the journey. Finally, Shannon's mother said, the minister would step forward, look us all in the eyes, and say, people of God, welcome home. Welcome home. Called to worship. In our psalm for this morning, the people of God have been called to worship. They've been called home, literally. Three times a year, the call went out to our ancestors in faith, the Hebrew people, to make the pilgrimage home to Jerusalem, to the temple, to worship God as they observed the three uh, annual feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Booths. Participation in these annual feasts, you understand, was not uh, optional. It was required of all Jewish males. Hearing that uh, this pilgrimage was something of a forced march, um, we wonder. We wonder how the Hebrew pilgrims felt about this long trek to Jerusalem. As they walked, sometimes up to 100 miles up to Jerusalem on foot, trudging, the hot and dry, dusty road. Was it all about holy obligation? Or was there something more that fueled their journey? Well, the opening verses of our psalm put to rest any notions that we might have of grudging participation in the annual pilgrimage. Do you remember those verses? Let's hear them again. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Wow, longing, fainting, singing for joy. The Hebrew people experienced pure joy as they received the call to worship and anticipated their journey to their spiritual home. It is clear that as the people of God arrive in Jerusalem, they are nearly beside themselves, eager to enter into worship. They simply can't wait to worship God. Now, worship. This is what they understood it meant to be God's people. This is why we make this long, strenuous trip this journey home. This is our purpose as a people, our reason for existence, to worship our God, to experience the wonder of the living God. Now, I'm not going to ask you uh, if you felt this same level of um, excitement, joy, anticipation, and conviction as you rolled out of bed and got your breakfast this morning and prepared to make your way to Valley uh, either in person or online. Um, but I hope some of you did. Um, 
But I also understand that as we gather for worship each week, there is a complicated mix of reasons that motivate us. Some of us come to worship out of habit. It's just what we do. Some of us are in the midst of challenging circumstances, and we've come hoping to hear an encouraging word in an otherwise difficult week. Some of us come longing for answers to questions, questions that we carry deep inside, questions that weigh on our hearts and our minds. This morning, I want to suggest that whatever we may have thought or felt upon waking, you and I, we are here today in worship because, well, we've been called to worship. In the words of one minister, it doesn't matter that you planned on attending worship this morning or not. You are a called people. You're here because your God has called you by name. Even before our service began, God took the initiative. We made preparations, yes, but God took the initiative and called out to each one of us to come. God has called us to worship. Our worship is always a response to God's prior call. I think Richard Foster says it so right when he says, worship is our response to the overtures of love from the heart of God. So, like the Hebrew people, we've come to our spiritual home this morning. We have answered God's call to worship, and we're here to do just that, to worship. But I do wonder, what do we hope will happen as we respond to God's call to worship? As we offer ourselves in worship to this one who is truly so deserving of our praise, in his lovely book, Telling the Truth, uh, Presbyterian minister and author Frederick Beekner suggests that people come to worship in the hope that somehow God will become real to them. I think that Beekner has it right. Most of us come to worship hoping that God is real, that God will be here, and that we might be welcomed home by this God, whom the scriptures reveal to us is one who is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You see, there is, I believe, inside each and every one of us a longing, very much uh, like what the psalmist expresses in our psalm for this morning. A longing. C.S. Lewis described it as the inconsolable longing. Augustine described it as restlessness. You, O oh God, he said, have made us for yourself, and our hearts, well, they're restless until they find their rest in you. Presbyterian minister Craig Barnes describes our longing as a longing for home our heart's true home. It is a longing inside each of us as we come to this place to worship. No matter what you call it, longing, restlessness, I know what it looks like. I do know what it looks like. It looks like John. John was a 50-something-year-old man who surfaced, literally, at First Presbyterian Church Portland when I served as pastor there. After his first Sunday, he continued to attend 10 o'clock worship week after week. He entered the sanctuary at precisely 9.59 every Sunday. He sat in the balcony way up in the corner, last row, as far from any other worshiper as he could possibly be. And then, right after the postlude, he slipped out very careful never to interact with anyone in the sanctuary until one day when I saw him making for the door to make his exit I was just in the right place <laughs> and I literally reached over two people and grabbed his hand 
And I looked him in the eye and I said, bless you. And he stopped. And he looked at me. And I knew that look. And I said, thank you. I need that. And he left. John continued this pattern of slipping in and slipping out of worship for several weeks until finally one Sunday, he stopped me after worship and asked if we might talk. Well, (laughs) can I just say I dropped everything? I wanted to know more about this man. He told me about his life, his upbringing in a devoted Christian home, his pursuit of higher education, his many, many, and they were many, vocational successes, how he had drifted away from the faith for many years. He told me about the broken marriages, living the high life as a six-figure financial consultant, and how it all unraveled with his recent divorce, and then the financial downturn of 2008. He lost his high-paying job, and he was now driving a school bus to make ends meet. He had driven children down to a field trip downtown. While the children went to their field trip, he parked the bus and got out and decided he would take a walk. And his walk took him right to the exterior of First Presbyterian Church. And he's walked around the perimeter of First Presbyterian Church. He told me that he felt an intense sense of longing so much so that the next Sunday he returned for worship. Now, there's a lot more to John's story, uh, a lot more, but what I can tell you is that as he returned to worship week after week, month after month, he discovered that he was home. Beautiful pieces of music, the laughter of children during the children's moment, Timely sermons, quiet moments of prayer, a familiar hymn, receiving the bread and the cup, warm greetings during the passing of the peace, all created for him what our Celtic Christian brothers and sisters call thin places. Thin places. Places where the distance between heaven and earth become razor thin, and God is palpably present. As John encountered the living God, his deep restlessness was finally put to rest. His intense longing was finally satisfied. The psalmist puts it this way, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I might say it this way. A day, an hour, even a moment in the presence of God. This God who calls us to himself satisfies the longings of even the hungriest of human hearts. Friends, we find our heart's true home as we worship and trust this God who loves us with a love that simply will not let us go. People of God, welcome home. May it be so that all honor and glory may be given to the one who has been revealed to us as maker, most blessed redeemer, and friend. Amen? Amen. May it be so.
please join me in the affirmation of faith from the banquet of praise. We believe God is our creator and has promised us always. We believe Jesus Christ, fully God and fully human, is God's promise living among us. He experienced all the pain and joy and the challenges of human life. God's forgiving love was revealed to us when Jesus suffered death on the cross. He came back to new life and has promised us new life in unity with God. We believe the Holy Spirit is God's promise, touching our spirits, guiding us even through the darkest and most difficult moments of our lives. We believe God is among us in community, mysterious yet very real. God promises to be with us always, even to the end of ages. Amen. Please be seated. And let us now look to God in prayer. Oh Lord, indeed you have called us uh, to worship today, and we've come uh, eager, eager to meet with you, eager to sing your praises, for you indeed are worthy of praise from every mouth, worthy of confession from every tongue, and worthy of worship from every creature. Hear us now as we, your people, lift our prayers of thanks and praise and intercession to you. We begin with prayers for our world. Lord, we pray for places of conflict and discord in our world. Of course, we continue in our prayers for an end to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Lord, we don't understand how it's going to happen, but we do pray earnestly for a peaceful end to this conflict. Please, in your mercy, may it be so. Lord, right here in our own country, um, we are just devastated by the images of flooding in Kentucky. Our hearts are heavy as we observe these images of destruction. Please, God, in your mercy, would you speed relief and tangible assistance to those areas that have been hardest hit. Here in our own community, uh, Lord, we uh, pray for those who have been struggling with the relentless heat of the past week. There's so many vulnerable populations around us. We pray, O oh God, that you would speed relief uh, to those who are most affected by this heat. We pray, uh, Lord, your watchful care over those who have no choice, um, especially those public servants who are serving us well. Uh, would you provide shelter for them? In our own congregation, dear Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us in our work and in our worship. Fill our hearts as only you can with your self-giving love, that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may reflect Jesus Christ. Look with compassion today, O oh God, on all who are suffering among us. We particularly pray for members of our congregation who have been recently hospitalized, who've had surgical procedures, and those who are now in rehabilitation facilities. A great physician, we do ask earnestly that you would extend your healing grace to those who are struggling in mind, body, and spirit. Not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and the joy of your supportive care. O oh, do, Lord, this day comfort those who are mourning, Especially we lift up Beth Bush in the death of her husband Kent this week. Uh, may she experience your very near presence during this time of loss and sorrow. May the risen Christ be her hope during this hard season. May the risen Christ be our hope. Dear God, in your loving purpose, we pray that you would answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all the things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's continue in the worship of God as we give of our tithes and offerings. Lord, indeed, we do want to walk as children of light. We want to bring your light and life to bear in the darkest places of our world, that the world might know that you live. May these offerings, these tithes, uh, may they be a part of this ongoing revolution of love. We ask it all in the name of the one that we follow, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
People of God, we have been refreshed in the presence of the Lord, but it's time to go. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you this day and forevermore. Let God's people together say, Amen. Amen.